Well, yes, the story of the Lunar Bible. Uh, the Lunar Bible was a conceptualization of uh, Reverend John Stout, who was a pastor of the Apollo Prayer League in Houston. And Ed White of Apollo One fame, who perished in Apollo One, was one of his parishioners and a very devoted man. And uh, they came up with the notion of uh, getting a Bible to the moon. And uh, it went through iterations. They were uh, made microfilm Bibles. There were photographs of the Bible, pages of the Bible, but in microfilm size, so that a full Bible is not more than just a, an inch and a half square but with all the pages in different different frequencies on, on the on the page. And uh, presumably, although I didn't check it personally, uh, different frequencies had different uh, languages. Oh goodness! Huh? So it was a, a really a multifaceted lunar Bible, and they tried to carry it. Uh, of course, Ed White did not get to carry it because he didn't he perished. Uh, they tried to carry it on Apollo 11 and 12 and 13, and it never really quite worked out. For some reason, I don't know why. But when it came to Apollo 14, the Reverend Stout brought, uh, uh, asked me, would I be willing to take uh, copies of the Lunar Bible, of the little Bible to the moon, and bring it back? And I said, well, if it fits in uh, my little personal preference kit and does not overload the weight, uh, yes. So I said, give it to my tech, who was responsible for storing all of that on the spacecraft. And uh, he did, and when it was all over with, I gave it back to him. And that was the last I was really involved with it, except uh, the certifying on different occasions, like this one, for example. That yes, indeed, I did carry uh, the little microfilm Bibles that, uh, on the first trip uh, onto the surface of the moon on the spacecraft Antares. Wow. How many of them were there? I believe I was, I didn't personally count them. But I was told that there were a hundred little microfilm Bibles in that wow. pa little pack that I took. Wow, that's really cool. Who 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 has those now? Well, they've been destroyed. I gave them back to Reverend Stout. Then he made arrangements, and I believe uh, most of some of them were distributed locally to members of the Apollo Prayer League. Others. Uh, Reverend Stout gave to other places, but final, in the final analysis, I believe he made a deal with a gentleman by the name of David Froman, who, uh, on behalf of Reverend Stout and the Apollo Prairie, uh, sold quite a number of them throughout the country over the years, but I, I don't know the details of that. Huh, interesting. Well, that's a really cool story. Yeah. How oh, neat. The only place I've, I've come in contact a couple of times with, uh, well, most recently, with a gentleman who was the president of a Hobby Lobby organization who bought, bought one of the Bibles from uh, Dave Froman and they wanted to come to my house and uh, photograph me with uh, oh. the Bible and the, the gentleman so that they had that record. Oh wow, that's cool. Yeah. How neat. Very cool. Well, thank you for that story. That's the story. Are there any other interesting <laughs> moon stories you'd like to tell? Well, well there's a lot of stories. <laughs> lots, about, lots of stories. But, uh, not to come to mind right now. <laughs> okay, all right. The one you just told me about the, you could, you could have been flying on 13 versus 14. Ooh. Well, yeah, I could have been flying on 13. Uh, except uh, Alan Shepard came uh, Alan Shepherd came on the crew to replace Gordon Cooper and the uh, managers in Washington because Alan had been grounded with Meniere syndrome for quite some time uh, they thought he needed a little more training time than we had if we were going to fly Apollo 13 so we switched missions with Jim Lovell and his crew they took 13 we took 14 they got a bad machine we got a good machine <laughs> and uh, with that, also on Apollo 13 was Kent Mattingly, who had been bumped from the flight because he had been exposed to one of the astronauts' kids' measles. And so he and I ended up on the ground on Apollo 13, 
as the two senior lunar module and command module pilots on the ground. And our job during the recovery of Apollo 13 was to go to the simulators, he and uh, Ken and the command module, me and the lunar module, and do, Ken's job was to, to figure out how to get the command module back through the atmosphere with virtually no power left in the command module system. Wow. My job was to do uh, practice everything they would have to do with the lunar module as the lifeboat tugboat to bring the crew home. And I I did that in the lunar module simulator before they had to do it in space Gosh, wow. to make sure that they could get home. Okay. That wow. was our contribution to That's a big responsibility. Yeah. Goodness, wow. That's pretty crazy. There's something I can't remember and when we when you and Doc for the last time coming back from the moon, the probe and drove the probe would that, did that stay with the lunar module? Did you fire the ring to separate out, or would you wait before you came back in the atmosphere? Do you remember? I'm sorry, repeat your question. Uh, you know, the probe, the, the drogue that you, uh, the probe that we retracted and it collapsed and you put it and you stowed it in the crew compartment. On the last time when they came back up from the moon and you docked, and when you separated from the lunar module, did the probe? No, it stayed with the lunar module. It stayed with, okay, I just, I just couldn't remember that. I know yeah. I see, I got pictures of it when it's in the water and it's not there, so. Yeah. Okay. You just fired the whole ring off. Yeah. That's what I thought. Good deal. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>